to another episode of the Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. On this episode, I'm thrilled to have Cleve TA on the show. He is a founder of ClevEanalytics.com and one of the most well-respected NFL analysts out there. TA, welcome to the show. Hey, Ed. How you doing? I'm, uh, I was asking before the show, I hope uh, you're uh, settled down from that Michigan uh, National Championship win. I'm sure everybody <laughs> in Ann Arbor is still celebrating. Everybody is. I was up way too late on Monday night. I was actually okay on Tuesday. I felt okay. And then it hit me Tuesday night. And then I felt not the best this morning. You know, you know how sleep kind of takes like a two day cycle. Especially as we get older, right? Yep. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Well, thank you for joining me. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, as Ohio State alum, I was uh, sad to see the win, but uh, I'm I'm over it. Uh, I'm happy for <laughs> Michigan fans. So uh, hopefully, we get we get the rivalry continuing. We will. We will. This podcast is brought to you by the Power Ranks Sports Betting Newsletter. Looking for some action on any given weekend? This is the free service for you. As Five Nugget Saturday is my curated list of tips and analytics I curate from people like Cleve Ta who do excellent work. To sign up for free, go to thepowerrank.com. TA, I really want to ask you about Joe Flacco. He has come in from off the couch he to the Cleveland Browns. How surprised are you at his performance this year, and how do you see this Cleveland team going into the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, if you would have told me before the season started that I'd be sitting here uh, at wild card weekend waiting for Joe Flacco and Jerome Ford to lead this team to a uh, potential Super Bowl. I would have uh, called you crazy. I mean, it was just a, it's an unbelievable story just seeing the progression of this Browns team from, and, uh, you know, a lot of people had some some personal uh, issues with, with the Deshaun Watson signing, which I understand, and uh, are the trade and, um, you know, uh, weren't, weren't really a fan to now, like, I think everyone's kind of on board with the kind of, you know, the lovable Browns at this point. I think they're very likable with uh, Flacco at, at the, at the helm and a really good defense. And yeah, I mean, I, I, when they signed him, it was one of those, like, all right, I guess you're just putting a body out there. That's a a veteran. He's better than what they had with, uh, with PJ Walker and and DTR. Um, You know, I was, I was kind of lukewarm. I, I wanted someone with a little more mobility, uh, but at the end of the day, he's just been a revelation. And it's funny because, you know, you could tell that Kevin Stefanski really trusts him. Their neutral game pass rate has exploded uh, under Flacco. Before he he came uh, to the Browns, they were in the you know upper 20s in terms of, uh, I think they were 55% neutral game pass rate. And now they're like 68%, <laughs> one of the best, one of the highest rates in the NFL. You know, they're, they're run and play action. Uh, at, a, at a high rate, which, you know, Kevin Stefanski loves. I think it's just a natural fit. Uh, Joe Flacco was in the, the Gary Kubiak offense, which is where uh, um, Stefanski kind of learned his offensive system uh, in Minnesota. So uh, there's a lot of synergies there and, it, and it's really taken off and they're pushing the ball down the field a lot with, with Flacco. So they've got, he's got the third highest A dot uh, in the NFL for this season. So he's pushing it down the field. They're number three in explosive pass rate. So all the things that they weren't doing uh, earlier in the season, uh, they're doing now. They're passing more and pushing it down the field, and they're getting explosive plays. And you know that's how you win in the NFL uh, is being able to get those chunk plays because it's just so hard to consistently sustain those long drives and, and not make mistakes. And so you know it has been a revelation. And he he has you know he has turned the ball over a decent amount. So with that kind of aggressive nature, you do get some. Um, some some risk. Uh, you know, he's thrown eight interceptions. He's got a handful of uh, fumbles as well. I think he's got uh, he's thrown at least one pick six. Could have had a couple more that were dropped. So you know, there there is a, a, a hit or miss um, you know type of perspective here with Flacco. But uh, uh, no doubt, this team at least has he gives them at least a fighter's chance with that defense uh, to potentially make a run here in the AFC. I think it's an incredible story when you bring in a 38 year old who let's just say he sucked last year with the Jets. You bring him in, you think that the coach is going to be a little conservative, but as you mentioned, he's just chucking it down the field with a high a dot. And maybe you can, uh, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but I presume the a dot for Dorian Thompson, Robinson, DTR and, and PJ Walker was not so high. No, not at all. Dorian Thompson Robinson, I have uh, 6.1, which is one of the lowest in the NFL. And um, let's see, I, I don't have P.J. Walker offhand, but I know it was similar, similarly low. I mean, Desha- Deshaun Watson was actually a little bit higher. He was closer to nine. 
Uh, but yeah, uh, Joe Flacco is, is just under 10. Um, and, you know, Watson, it felt like he was just kind of chucking him. And there was no, there were a handful of times there was nobody around when he would throw it deep. So it wasn't very successful, but Flacco is hitting those at a really high rate. So, um, and it's to him, you know, he's on the money with some of these throws. Like there are times where he'll drop back and you see him chuck it and you're like, oh, where's this going? And it's like dead on the money to uh, a lot of times to Amari Cooper. So he's just been awesome uh, with those deep, deep balls. And it's just a completely different uh, uh, situation and offense that uh, Stefanski has had to, to shuffle with, with a guy like Flacco versus, you know, some of the young guys like DTR and, and PJ Walker and guys who just can't really run his system the way he wants to run it. So it, that's why I think, honestly, uh, Stefanski does uh, deserve the coach of the year award because of, you know, just changing his uh, being able to adapt for each of the different styles of these quarterbacks. I mean, the difference between Joe Flacco and Deshaun Watson is night and day with their, you know, stylistically. Uh, and he's able to, uh, he's been able to adapt on the fly. So uh, you got to give him a lot of credit for that. Cleveland's defense has been epically good as well. I, you've posted some analysis on Twitter on just how they, good they are, I think, per drive. Um, maybe tell us about this defense and and who you think is like their second most important player behind Miles Garrett. Yeah, I mean the defense has had they've had a really interesting year because when they they're bullies when when they face a rookie quarterback or a backup they completely decimate them. Um, you know when you look at what Arizona threw out there with Clayton Tune, I mean that was the lowest uh, uh, EPA any quarterback has posted in any game this year. Uh, when you look at what they did to Joe Burrow in the opener when he couldn't even move uh, back there with his calf injury with Ryan Tannehill and that horrible offensive line with the Titans. Like they just overwhelm bad quarterbacks, bad offensive lines. So you have no shot uh, if you're in that situation. But, you know, truth be told, when they have stepped up in class from a quarterback situation, when they have faced really smart offensive minds like a Sean McVay or even a, a Shane Steichen, I will say those those offensive coordinators and those those teams have done a good job of creating ex- explosive plays. So the Browns are really, you know, Browns are number one in, in kind of down to down success, but they have allowed a, a decent chunk of uh, big plays when it comes to the run and the pass. So you can't hit those on them. They're so aggressive. The Jim Schwartz defense is just kind of attack, attack, attack. If you're able to to run some some misdirection and some play action and some RPOs, you can you know, beat this defense. That is the one weakness is you kind of use their aggression against them. And that's what a guy like McVay and Shane Steichen, that's what they really did in those games. And that's why they let up over 30 points in both of those games. So, you know, that is their kind of kryptonite is, you know, uh, being too aggressive at times, trying to get to the quarterback as much as they can. And they they do allow, you know, once they uh, a player gets past the first level, you know, they have allowed some, some chunk plays. I mean, in terms of I mean, importance on the defense, it's tough to say because they have so many good players defensively. But I do think that uh, a guy like Denzel Ward, who's kind of uh, who's really their shutdown corner, the number one cornerback, you can put him on, on any receiver and not really worry about it. Uh, they do have a good depth in the secondary, too. So I, I don't want to act like they, you know, if he's lost, that they can't um, still defend some of these receivers. But having a guy like Martin Emerson uh, and Greg Newsom, who's mainly in the slot, you know, those guys are, are much better and much more suited against number twos and threes than they are against number one. So, um, you know, it's hard to say because there's so many good players, but I, I do think Denzel Ward is kind of that shutdown corner. Um, you know, you can't isolate them and do some of the things with your defense. It's probably the, the second key behind uh, Miles Garrett. Cleveland is a two and a half point favorite at Houston. Houston's an interesting situation because they do have a rookie quarterback, but CJ Stroud has been incredibly successful. How do you see the game playing out? Yeah, you know, I got to take off my uh, brown, my my brown colored glasses here as a fan. And, <laughs> right, to be honest, of course. I, yeah, it, it's difficult because, you know, and I, I'm in a couple group chats, and some and people ask me, "What do you think the spread will be?" This is before the uh, the Houston Indy game, and kind of evaluating what I thought the spread would be, no matter who we faced. And I thought that I honestly thought that the Houston, um, I thought Houston would be either be like a one point favorite or a pick them. I, I knew there would be some sort of you know, premium on uh, or, or discount on uh, the rookie quarterback starting his first game against a veteran. But I think this is substantially off of where, where I would have made it. And again, maybe I'm off. Maybe it's just my, you know, I've been scorned too much as a Browns fan. Uh, but, you know, let, let me walk you through this. So a couple of weeks ago, Houston played the Browns. And this was a week after 
Stroud had missed a game due to his concussion and all expectations were he was going to play against the Browns. So the opener came out and I think it was a, a, a Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. It was sitting at Houston minus two and a half. And then later that day, I think early evening, a uh, story came out that, you know, he, he's not going to practice and he's not going to play. And quickly, you know, money started pouring in on the Browns and I ended up closing, I think, minus three for the Browns. But as a reminder that it opened Houston minus two and a half. So the expectations were that with C.J. Stroud, this is a uh, Houston, Texas team that would be a two and a half point favorite. They didn't have Will Anderson in that game either, by the way. So, you know, I, I was looking back and said, all right, it can't be Houston minus two and a half again. There, there have to be some adjustments to, you know, this Browns team that played really well against Houston and then played really well against the Jets. And you've got, you know, the, again, this this kind of tax you're paying on a rookie quarterback making his first start with a rookie head coach against a veteran uh, team like the Browns. But I didn't think it would be it would completely flip and it would be the Browns minus two and a half or three. Like, I just think this is this is a little bit much. So. It's hard. Like I would, you know, I'm not going to bet against my team. That's just not going to do it. They're in the playoffs. It's a rarity for me. So um, I, I wouldn't do that. I think that, you know, maybe getting the, the Texans on a teaser leg, uh, kind of that long teaser number through through the, the three and the seven uh, is a really good look. Um, you know, you can probably pair that up with, uh, you know, maybe the, the Cowboys. Um, but and we could talk about some other options, but I, I think that's probably the right look. I just think I can't, I can't justify taking the Browns here. Like I said, unless you really, really are able to quantify um, a guy like Stroud in his rookie season playing in the playoffs and what that effect is, it's just hard for me to do that. Um, I, I just it's hard for me to lay a full field goal with uh, with a guy like Flacco and, um, you know, on the road here in the playoffs. And I just think C.J. Stroud's a different animal. Uh, it's funny. I think the last time I was on your show last year, you had asked me midseason. I uh, did. C.J. Stroud. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. You had asked I do. Me, like, I absolutely C.J. remember him. Yeah, you, you asked, is he another Justin Field? I said, no, this is a totally different guy. Like this, he is a an elite passer. He's accurate, like just just a wizard in the pocket. And, that, and he translate, you know, he translated immediately to the pros. When he's in a clean pocket, he is unstoppable. Uh, I will say, obviously, he has faced some pressure, and his numbers significantly have dropped. Now all quarterbacks do when they see pressure, but his has dropped pretty substantially. So, and he hasn't faced a ton of great pass defenses. I mean, the Jets he really struggled against. Uh, the Saints, he was okay against. Uh, the Ravens was, you know, his his first ever career start. He struggled. So, you know, when he has had to step up against the top secondaries, the top defenses, you know, he has, um, you know, struggled a bit. But, you know, I, I do think that he's just so good in the pocket that if he could get some time, you know, he can make some plays. I, I just think that uh, the number is a little bit too rich. So I, I'm not going to touch it either way. But, um, you know, to me, this is kind of a, a Texans or a Texans teaser or a pass for me from just an unbiased uh, perspective. Yeah. And I certainly trust uh, your analysis to, to, to get away from your, your fandom. I think all of us as analysts have to have to do that. TA uh, Philadelphia has struggled down the stretch. Uh, now they trample. Now they travel to Tampa Bay, the division winner. They are three point favorites. Uh, how do you see this game playing out? Yeah, I, uh, so I took two, I've made two bets so far, and this is one of them. I do uh, like Tampa uh, at three. I also actually did kind of a half half on Tampa plus three and a half on uh, the team total under for the Eagles at 23 and a half. I just I can't justify this number, uh, to be honest with you. I think if you, if you um, had the bookmakers kind of uh, put blinders on and said, like, I don't, I, you, you're not allowed to know who the team is. You're just looking at their actual – data for the year uh, and their statistics, like what what would this number be? And I do think that Tampa would have been favored if you didn't know anything else about these teams. So for, for Philly to be a three-point favorite, it, it's strictly due to priors, right? Like that's the only way you can get to this number. And I just don't believe, even if you want to give your priors credit, um, and again, that's always a, a difficult modeling exercise. You probably know more than, way more than me on this, but you know, even if you wanted to give that some some credence, I still think this should be, you know, Philly as a smaller favorite. Uh, and I think getting on the key number of three is, is, is impactful here. I mean, they're talking about an Eagles team that has just a plus five point differential on the season. I don't know many people realize that they're barely above above water when it comes to point differential. And we know that historically a point differential is a good way to kind of um, uh, measure team strength, uh, kind of a simple measure. And it's the second worst uh point diff of any playoff team behind the Steelers who are negative 20. 
you know, and it's not like that number is skewed by, oh, Jalen Hurts was out a bunch of games or they faced the toughest schedule in the NFL. I mean, Hurts has played every game, um, started every game. If you look at some of the the, the strength of schedule uh, uh, measures out there, DVOA has them as a 23rd ranked uh, strength of schedule. Sagarin ratings have them 21st. So like it's, it's an easier schedule that they face than average. So it's not like they've been overwhelmed by just a, a ton of uh, difficult matchups here. And now you got to play on the road without, uh, well, and say without, Jalen Hurts has got a, a, a injured middle finger in his throwing hand. You have Devontae Smith, who missed last game with an ankle sprain. Who knows if he'll play or how much or how effective he'll be. A.J. Brown sprained his MCL. Um, he'll likely play, but again, you know, cutting might be an issue. So you've got a completely banged up offense um, that has been underwhelming just in general. Um, going up against a solid veteran Tampa defense. Um, and I just think at some point, like, you know, we did this all year with Tampa last year in the Bucks. You know, we just hang on to our priors, just assuming eventually the light is going to, you know, flash on and the team is going to turn it on and, and win in the playoffs and make a run. But it's just like they sh- they've showed us who they are. You know, they haven't, it's been six straight games since they have not covered a spread. They lost, you, know, you lose at home to Arizona. You you look horrible against Tyrod, Tyrod Taylor and the Giants to the, to the point where you have to pull the plug at halftime because uh, all your guys are getting hurt and you're just not playing well. I mean, defensively, they're one of the worst defenses in the NFL, just in general, uh, on the season 30th in EPA. But they have really fallen off a cliff the last seven weeks. I mean, they're they, they allowed the third lowest rate of explosive plays the first 11 games of the season um, and at just over 7%. In the last seven games, third highest rate at 12%. Um, they're bottom five in literally every key defensive metric. The middle of the field's open on them. Their linebacking core is very slow. It's, it's uh, you know, they had to sh- sign Shaq Leonard who can't move anymore. I mean, they've allowed almost 31 points per game in the last seven games. And that's to offenses like, to like uh, the Giants and Seattle with Drew Locke. You know, they get likely get Darius Slade back at corner, but he hasn't been very good. He's like, you know, you know 50th in PFF coverage grade. Um, like, there's just so many reasons here that that I just don't believe you can lay uh, a number like this w- with this Eagles team. And I just think that um, it makes, you know, uh, you know, I like Tampa here. The only reason I kind of split it up between Tampa plus three and I took the you know, some on the under the team total for Philly. It was just in case Baker Mayfield, he's banged up a little bit. He's got a sprained ankle. He you know, hurt his ribs two games ago. Hasn't looked great. Didn't look great against Carolina. You know, if he really is banged up, maybe this is a lower scoring game and, you know, Philly does end up winning. But, you know, at least I, I have the uh, the under of the, the Eagles team total here because I'm just not convinced that with all of these injuries against a good veteran uh, defense like like Tampa, um, that they're going to get to that number. And quite honestly, if you look at the Philly game log offensively this year, again, I, this could be cir- circumstantial, but the bottom five EPA games have all been on the road this season. Six of their seven worst EPA games on offense have been on the road. And one of them was against Tampa. So, you know, um, it's not as if that, uh, you know, they're, they're great war- road warriors anyway. So um, th- those are the two plays I like in this game. I just looked at my numbers, TA, and I actually would make Tampa Bay a slight favorite if we only looked at data from this year. The way I do it is a bunch of passing metrics, and then there's a market model in there as well that's still data from the current season. So, uh, yeah, so my numbers would agree with that. And, uh, yeah, thank you for your insights there. Uh, Want to move on? Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't know how you handle priors because this is. I think this is this is what that is, right? Like you said, like how – how do you weigh priors here? Because you just can't you can't justify Philly being favored at all, let alone this number, unless you are just saying this we are we are assuming that they are gonna go back to normal, right? It's just and that's just the difficulty of this uh of modeling this, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Absolutely. Yeah, let's actually move on to the next game because the Rams go to Detroit. And this is I I've never eliminated priors until this year. And I actually made the decision to do that on both Houston and uh, the Los Angeles Rams because I I don't feel like either of these teams reflect what we thought they were in the preseason. You know, I've done a lot of work with, you know, preseason, you know, I mean, look, the preseason definitely adds to the overall predictive nature if you keep it in at this point in the season. But I certainly don't think it makes sense for all teams. Um, So. There's no Rams prior. And, you know, I was a little horrified, especially living here near Detroit, that um, 
when when I my numbers do make the lines about a one point favorite. So I was interested in your uh, opinion on this game, and you know, again th- with the Rams, another team like the Eagles that you can uh, you know say that the prior doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I, I did my second wager um, that I actually was the first wager I made this week, but the, the number two wager is uh, the Rams at three, plus three and a half. It's been kind of oscillating between three and three and a half all week. You kind of get it, you're getting some resistance, I think, on both ends. Uh, but I just think that the, this is more like I have uh, Detroit minus two uh, for me personally. That's that's a number I make this. And I mean, I think. You know, it's the playoffs. So you're not getting typically huge edges here. Uh, so you have to find them where, where you can. And I just think that the way uh, this Rams offense has operated when at, at full health, which, again, if you're using kind of full season data, you're not going to get there. And, you know, using full season, full season data, you're probably more like three, three and a half or even four. But when you look at the eight games that the Rams have played with a healthy lineup, and that includes Cooper Cup and, and Kyron Williams uh, specifically, obviously along with Matt Stafford. Um, there's eight games that they've been healthy together. They're averaging 28 and a half points, and they would have the, the NFL's number two EPA ranked offense behind San Francisco. If you look at just those games, okay? Um, so we're talking about an elite offense here. They scored 26 plus in six straight games with all of those guys. And they're not doing it against like really poor competition. They're doing it against the Browns, the Ravens, and the Saints. Those are three top five EPA defenses. We know that the Ravens and the Browns are 1-2 in EPA. They scored 30-plus on all three. Um, and like, and the EPA that, those t- that the Rams generated on those defenses represents the single highest EPA that any offense has generated on any of those defenses. So they are, uh, from an apples-to-apples comparison, you know, they are an elite offense, in my opinion. They've proven it. They face this Detroit defense, which is just uh, in the bottom 10 by pretty much all metrics. Um, and they've done it. I mean, if you look at the, the raw numbers, uh, Detroit's 21st in EPA, but they've generated the fifth most EPA from turnovers. Uh, okay, if you exclude those turnovers, they're more like 25th in EPA, and they're 30th against a pass. And they've, they've, they've allowed the highest rate of explosive pass plays uh, in the NFL. Like, I just think that, this is the only time the Rams have faced a, a defense, pass defense that is bottom five in that metric. I just think you give McVay a week to prepare. He's probably had two weeks, right? Like they, they sat everybody against the Niners, so I'm, I'm assuming that he had a game plan for for both Detroit and Dallas. He knew it was going to be one of those teams, likely. So you've got a week to prepare. It's a huge coaching edge when you look at McVay in that offense versus Aaron Glenn. Uh, and Aaron Glenn, the, look, the guy's a player's coach, right? Like he's an ex-player. You know, the, 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 the players love him in the locker room. He's not a good X's and O's coach. He's done nothing in two years there. You know, you're, you're in Michigan. You see it. Like, he hasn't done anything that would warrant, you know, uh, success from a defensive standpoint. So it's a huge edge from that coaching perspective. If you look at the other side, I mean, yeah, Ben Johnson, really good uh, offensive mind. So, you know, he's going to draw some stuff up. But you've got Raheem Morris, really good defensive coordinator. And you've got Sean McVay going up against Jared Goff. Like, who knows Goff's weaknesses inside out more than they do? So you probably have an edge in that perspective. Um, I, I look, they played, actually, the Jared Goff did play the Rams a couple of years ago uh, in his return, and he just had, like, a mediocre game. It wasn't, wasn't terrible. It wasn't good. I, I just, I, you know, and you lose, you lose Sam Laporta. He's probably not going to play uh, uh, in the playoffs. Huge, huge issue at tight end. They don't really have a good backup. Um, you've got a guy like Jameson Williams is going to play, but he's banged up. Khalif Raidman, who it doesn't, it wouldn't normally be a big loss uh, if he doesn't play this week. He got hurt last week against Minnesota, but the Rams have one of the worst special teams that we've seen in a number of years. Like they're really bad. Uh, uh, the reason they didn't cover that game against the Giants is because they let up that punt return late uh, to the Giants, but they're not very good at special teams. They could have had an edge if, if Raymond is able to play, but he may not play. So, you know, they lose out on, on one of the, the small edges that they have there at special teams. So like to me, you know, there's edges all over the place for the Rams. And then you look defensively, there's a lot of no names outside of Aaron Donald for the Rams, uh, but they've done a really nice job. They're kind of middle of the pack. When you look at all the advanced metrics, the EPA and success rate, they're kind of like 15 to 18 range, but they've done it without uh, creating any turnover turnovers at all, so they're kind of the opposite of what you see with the with the Lions. You know, they're kind of an average defense that hasn't benefited from turnovers. If they start getting some of those lucky breaks, you know, starting this week, recovering some of those fumbles that they haven't been able to recover, uh, maybe get some tip passes. Like they they can really do some things in the playoffs. So 
all in all, I just think that, you know, and this defense has been tested. They faced the Niners and the Ravens and Green Bay and Dallas. Like they've faced some really good uh, offenses here and they've been able to hold up. So I think it's going to be a really fun game. Uh, I'm not saying that the Rams are going to win. I just think that uh, if you're getting, if you're giving me three to three and a half within a, with literally a top three offense and the coaching advantages, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take the Rams all day. Excellent. T.A., you said you your numbers had Detroit by about two. Can you give us a sense for the the kind of data that goes into that prediction? Yeah, I mean, I'm not – I don't live and die by my model. It's more of a – for me, it's kind of like it, – it's a, a gut check more than anything. You know, I'm just not – I just don't believe that my model is going to outperform, you know, uh, the market. But it does give me a good sense of kind of what my, my head thinks and what my matchup – analysis come you know the conclusion i come to and so it's, it's a good way for me to kind of say all right the, the, now now it kind of checks and jives with what you know i'm looking at from a you know a qualitative perspective and kind of a matchup perspective so i just got i've got a handful of stats it's, it's really um without going into too much detail um it's more matchup based than anything to be honest um and you know i i'm i you know that for for home field I'm, I'm pretty generic with it i don't go too overboard but you know, it has, you know, like I said, it, it does give me a good gut check. So, you know, um, I, I think kind of how teams play in neutral game settings uh, matters a lot in, in my in my model. Um, I adjust for opponent uh, both uh, off, uh, uh, offensively and defensively. So um, and I discount turnovers a decent amount. Uh, I'll just say that. And maybe I shouldn't, but uh, I, I exclude uh, some of the turnover numbers as well. So that gets me to a number that I think is at least comparable to where the market should be. Uh, and it's rare for me to be really far off the market. Um, in that case, I'm doing something wrong or there's injuries involved or something. But um, like I said, it's just it, it's a nice little gut check. And if it agrees with what my handicap is generally, then uh, I typically go with it. Excellent. TA, you put together a uh, NFL preview uh, it has been it has become my go to resource for how I prep for teams. You do an excellent job with your analysis. I also like it because your uh, words are concise. It's not four thousand, five thousand words per team, uh, <laughs> and I get a good sense for for everything. You know, one of the things you did last year was this idea of blended fourth quarter win probabilities. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the main idea was like you know your win probability can change so much at the end on just a player to. Let's look at what that win probability was in the, the majority of the fourth quarter, and that's probably better. Um, that gives you a better sense for how good a team is. So uh, first, let me know if that's right, but maybe give us a sense for how you put that together and what metrics that you may be cooking up for the 2024 version of that preview. Yeah, so I think you kind of you know uh, summarize it well. It's it's not that far off of you know Pythagorean expectation, right, where we use point differential. Um, to help us maybe ascertain who are the kind of overvalued or undervalued teams um, going into the, the next season. Uh, it just it removes some of the flukiness at the end of games that I think occur, both in close game uh, metrics as well as kind of blowouts. Like there's a lot of stuff that is just irrelevant late in games. You might get games that are, you know, um, turning into a blowout and then like just so many fluky things happen. You get a couple of pick sixes or just crazy stuff happens that really isn't, um, doesn't, doesn't do a good job of surmising what actually happened in the game. And so win probabilities, uh, when you use, uh, especially your kind of mid to early fourth quarter, do a better job just historically when you look at some of the, um, correlation metrics to, um, to results the next season, just a slightly, does a slightly better job than, than some of the Pythagorean numbers that we found, uh, that my analyst ran for me. So it, it, again, and it caps win probability, right? Like you could be up to me, um, you know, if you're up, you know, 20 points uh, late in a game and you get a couple fluky late touchdowns to win by 40 or something like, you know, that to me uh, isn't uh, that extra right. point differential is, is sure. not as relevant. So, so yeah, win absolutely. probability at least, yeah, win probability is capped, right? You can only go to hundred <laughs> so, percent. Right. Right. So anyway, it does a better job of kind of um, you know, smoothing out some of that late game stuff. But um, and and I just, you know, it was, it was in my work that I was you know, finding uh, people would say, oh, this team went, you know, three and seven in one score games like they should regress the next year. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I, I watch a lot of those games. It really wasn't how the, the games played out. Some stuff happened late. Maybe it, there are times where a team will be down 10 points with, you know, 10 seconds left. Well, look at the, the Niners versus uh, the Rams this year, right? They kicked the field goal the Rams did down 10 with like two seconds left to lose by seven. Are you going to say that the Niners got lucky 
by winning that close game because technically it was a one score game. Like the, there's a handful of those situations that happen all year. So anyway, that kind of led me to um, analyzing this a little bit further. And then I'm a really smart analyst who kind of um, came up with with this metric and, and back tested it and um, you know did the things that that uh, he that he knows what to do more than I do. I'm not a statistician, so you know, he came up with this and we back tested it and it's been successful and actually did a really nice job this year um, for the teams that we thought were overvalued going into the season. Um, uh, if you look at some of the, uh, some of the numbers on my website, you could see like we were backing, you know, teams that we thought could, could uh, overperform uh, versus expect- expectations and looking at, you know, to make or miss the playoffs or, you know, some of the alt overs and unders, you know, some of them really hit hit well. So uh, it's been very successful for us. And it's a good way to look actually going into the playoffs, because I knew we we're going to talk about it today. Uh, I was looking at last year and looking at the last few years, you know, finding those matches, uh, the, those matchups between teams that really either overachieved or underachieved facing each other. The team that underachieved was has been winning and covering or at least covering at a really high rate the last couple of years that I looked, I have to go back even further because usually we're this was more of a predictive for the next season, not necessarily in season uh, in the playoffs, but just eyeballing it. I noticed a lot of times that, you know, when you have a big mismatch like that, um, even last year, you know, you had the, the Jags were one of the, the bigger underachievers going into the playoffs versus the Chargers, one of the biggest overachievers. And we saw the Jags coming back, ironically, right, um, <laughs> yep. in the fourth quarter to, to, to win and cover that game. There was a couple other instances. It's funny that the Giants played the – the Vikings, who are one two <laughs> in that metric last year, the two biggest overachievers. So they just so happened to play each other. And then when the Giants won, they got blown out by uh, uh, by the Eagles the next week. So you know, we, I saw, I did see a couple. Of, you know, the Ravens were one that were underachievers. And again, they didn't have Lamar Jackson, but they they could have won that game against Cincinnati, who was Absolutely. one of the bigger overachievers. Yeah. So it, it, it was a good way. So you know, uh, for me, it's just it's a nice nice way to see like, hey, who are these teams that might be you know, playing a little bit above their skis and vice versa. And if there's a way to, to, to play on that. So what teams kind of stick out this season? So uh, ironically, um, the Lions and the Rams uh, are two of the top four. So they play each other. So it's kind of a, a wash. You've got the Browns who are number three going up against the Texans who are seventh in that metric. So again, pretty, pretty close. The Steelers were the single, I mean, not shocking if you want, if you paid attention, the Steelers were the number one um, uh, most overvalued team from from our metric um, uh, in the NFL going up against Buffalo is kind of a, a middle of the pack kind of a, they, they played to their numbers if you will uh, so that would probably be the biggest kind of the biggest gap between teams Dallas is like 10th to Green Bay is 18th so maybe not much there so it really is the Steelers and Buffalo but that spread is so big right you know it, it's kind of factored in already so uh, they're not a ton to play on so maybe next round um you know, there'll be something there. Unfortunately, my Browns, like I said, are th- third highest. They played so right. many close games. Uh, it makes a lot of sense um, for that to be uh, a little bit overvalued. And then you would ask, is there anything coming this year? I, I haven't even thought about the off season yet. So, um, right. you know, usually these things occur as I do my work and, and things pop up and say, hey, what do you think? You know, maybe we should test this out. So we'll see if we come up with some, you know, something else uh, this off season. But, uh, you know, for now, we'll, we'll, we got to get through this season first for us. That sounds good. Yeah. The only reason I ask that is because sometimes when I'm watching games, especially during the playoffs, I think, hey, you know, that's something that I want to test. But your process is clearly different. So, you know, like you got to you got to start digging into your previews before you, you get those ideas. And, and that that works as well. Mm-hmm. Cleve TA, thank you so much for your time and joining me uh, on the show and uh, being so generous with your bets. Please let everyone know where they can find your work. Yeah, you could go to my website, cleveanalytics.com. Uh, I got a bunch of free things up uh, out there um, that I post. And then um, you know, I've got a playoff preview that I just put together uh, uh, about two days ago, kind of a one page or similar to my NFL preview, but for the playoffs, if you want to just take a quick look, a couple uh, kind of quick hitters for each team and you know, all the kind of summarizing all their data and, and uh, the EPA numbers on offense and defense. So um, you can find that up there. And uh, I have a ability if you want to subscribe and get a little bit more deeper analysis uh, write-ups on each of the games and the playoffs uh you can go to uh, the premium section and, and sign up so uh i appreciate you uh letting me uh, plug my site and uh, uh i appreciate uh, having me on absolutely i uh, really really respect your work um is there a way like 
if if someone wanted to buy your service, is there a way to buy the rest of the year or do you buy for a year or how does that work? Yeah, I just do it kind of season by season. I have a regular season package, obviously, um, could, uh, could have signed up regular season and playoffs together. Uh, but obviously the, the, the regular season is done. So it's just uh, if you go to um, the subscribe button, there is a playoff section in there um, and you'll be able to subscribe just for the playoffs. And then, you know, uh, obviously you know, for next year, I'll have of a regular season only and a regular season playoff package at a little bit discounted rate um, when we come back up in August. Excellent. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. Just a reminder, you can grab my free sports betting email newsletter. Go to thepowerrank.com. I will talk to you again next week.